I think I had a sweet time today. Okay, there we go, right on cue. Okay, welcome lesson two. Welcome to lesson two, where we kind of finish our day of lessons quite early today for the first time in well ever. Uh, and I give you that full full day to kind of work on all those assignments and study for the quiz. So lesson two is going to look at the timeline of DNA, specifically the steps and processes that led us to our understandings of how DNA works and how it is successful as that information storage molecule of all life on this planet. So recall that the observations of Mendel from grade 11 came, uh, they, were, they were really important with regards to the discovery of DNA and they came before the actual discovery of it. So before any of the structure was known about DNA, before any of the ideas of how it was replicated and passed on, Mendel observed that these traits were inherited from their parents and as a result of some factors, he could predict that inheritance pattern. And he did it all without understanding that microscopic component of DNA. So it's quite fascinating to think that, you know, in the 1800s even, uh, he was able to understand that heredity of DNA. In 2003, the Human Genome Project uh, was established and then completed. As a result, it sequenced all human DNA front to back. Not every person's DNA, just DNA as a whole. And so we can use that specific understanding of the sequence of human DNA to kind of treat patients based on their own unetic, unique genetic code. So it's quite interesting to, to, to consider the fact that we got there was, was largely in part in, impacted by our understanding of the structure and the discovery of the structure of that DNA. So working off of Mendel's works, we discovered in the 1800s, specifically 1868, that, uh, that Mesher understood that proteins were thought to be hereditary material because they can be very complex and were known to carry out that important cell function. So everyone in the 1800s, much like how we all know DNA now is responsible for it, in the 1800s it was thought that proteins were the means with which things were passed on. Mesher was interested in the cell's nucleus and he was able to, un, uh, to extract large quantities of an unknown acidic substance that contained phosphorus. He called this nuclein because he found it in the nucleus. So he extracted this acidic material, this acidic substance that contained phosphorus, and he extracted it from the nucleus. So this can kind of start to, this ties in a little bit to what you were saying about it earlier, Sissy, in terms of the ability for things with those phosphorus groups or those hydroxyl groups to impact the solution's pH level. And Mesher confirmed this essentially by removing this acidic substance from the nucleus that contained phosphorus. So in and of itself, this discovery wasn't too groundbreaking other than the fact that it was something different and unique, but it led to further discoveries of DNA. So one of those discoveries was the transformative principle that Griffith discovered at the end of World War I. And he was this medical officer attempting to kind of help patients with pneumonia uh, during the pneumonia epidemic in Europe to, to help them effectively. So in his research on pneumonia, he studied the effects of two strains of that bacteria. And he injected it, these uh, strains into mice. And so he tested basically how these two strains impacted mice. So the R strain was the rough strain, and it did not cause a disease within that mice. So the strain of pneumonia, the R strain, or rough strain, did not cause the disease and lead to death in that mice that they tested it on. However, the S strain, or the smooth strain, did in fact cause that disease, and it did in fact lead to that death. Now, he also tested the idea that mice injected with a heat killed S strain lived. So the S strain that was heated up did not kill that mice. And those cells were showing that the S strain cells must be alive in order to be virulent to the mice. However, when he injected the heated R strain cells, or sorry, heated S strain cells plus the live R strain cells, those live R strain cells were converted to virulent S strain cells. And as a result of that, that mice died. So the heat killed S strain plus living R strain cells was enough 
to kill that mice. So at the end of the day, the outcome discovery was that heredity substances can be passed on from dead cells to live cells. And these live cells can take in that material and effectively become virulent. He did not know what that substance was, but he called that substance the transforming principle or transforming factor. When we look at it in, in today's terminology, understanding it from today's terminology, transformation occurs when bacteria take on genetic material from their surroundings. And you, you learned about transformation in grade 11 biology, where they take on specific genomes or when they take on specific genetic pieces from other dead cells or from other cells in general, and they incorporate that genetic information into their genome. So that transformation process uh, was kind of discovered by Griffith during World War I as he attempted to save people from pneumonia. The rough and smooth strain were just names that were associated to the bacterial cells at a later date. Uh, the smooth strain bacteria lacked a lot of the protein markers on the cell, whereas the rough strain had a large amount of protein markers on the cell and it made the outside cell look quote unquote rough. Um, but that's, that's just the naming. Biologists are kind of weird in how they name stuff and why they name it certain ways. Uh, in this case, it was just how it looked. So. Transformation of DNA or by DNA, uh, according to Avery, McLeod, and McCarthy. So this is where we start to understand the idea of that transformation in the 1940s. This is just around World War II. And they also use S strain and R strain bacteria, except they extracted then destroyed the possible transforming substances, protein and DNA at that time. And they found that when they returned these substances to bacteria and cultured them, the DNA was that transforming principle. So DNA does contain proteins, those histones. And as a result of that, that DNA, which was that ultimately known as nucleon beforehand, uh, kind of helped us to understand that this was the specific thing that caused that transformation. And as a result of that, uh, they kind of determined how they could destroy proteins and DNA. So proteins denature as a result of heat or chemicals, uh, and also with regards to radiation and chemicals specifically with regards to DNA. So they kind of understood how it worked in terms of realizing that specific things get broken down or denatured as a result of whether they're protein or DNA, because heat doesn't necessarily kill DNA the same way that it denatures proteins uh, because proteins have those different bonds in DNA. But radiation uh, it does break down that DNA. And chemicals, depending on the type of chemicals, both of those can be used to break down protein and DNA. So when we think about complementary base pairing that we already know, we have to think of Chargaff's uh, experiments in the 1950s. And he did not agree with the idea that DNA contained those equal amounts of each base pair. So now we're looking at DNA no longer being called nuclein, and that DNA is now considered to be equal amounts of everything. All right, so we understand that that has a chemical makeup, and Chargaff did not agree with the idea that DNA contained equal parts of everything. So he discovered that each of the four bases occurs in definite ratios, and that understanding helps us to determine that it is going to be equal ratios as a result of that base pairing. But you can have, if you have 30% A, you're going to have 30% T, and then likewise 20-20 split between C and G. He tested these using radioactive isotopes, and they binded to different, uh, he made four different radioactive isotopes for each of the amino groups, or sorry, for the nucleotide groups. And he made that phosphorus group radioactive. So when he measured how much of each radioactive isotope of phosphorus was attached to each of the nucleotides, he determined that it was a ratio of A and T being equal to each other and C and G being equal to each other. So this kind of helps us to understand the underpinning idea that base pairs occur in specific ratios as a result of that Chargaff's experiments in the 50s. So now we are gonna start to look at DNA as the hereditary, her, hereditary molecule and it's, it's really started to, to take off with regards to uh, that Hershey and Chase with, in the 50s again, where they looked to prove that DNA and not protein was that hereditary molecule. So they looked at things called bacteriophages, which are viruses that infect bacteria specifically, and they contain specific genetic material, uh, DNA, and a protein 
like, and, and that capsid protein. So they were looking at DNA to be the main source of hereditary and not protein. So they, these bacteriophages were great because it was just DNA and a protein capsid. So the DNA contains that PO4, that phosphorus group, while the protein coat does not. It contains sulfur in certain amino acids, those R groups. So the phosphorus and sulfur isotopes differ uh, from average atomic mass. So they could weigh and measure the mass of each of those isotopes after that bacteriophage kind of did its things. So once the bacteriophages were removed from the surface of the cell, they could analyze the contents of that bacteria, the one that was uh, effect infected essentially by the bacteriophage. And they found that the radioactive isotopes allowed scientists to detect where they were. And so if proteins were the genetic material that gets passed on and allows for hereditary things to get passed on, they would expect that high concentration of sulfur within that bacteria. There would be more sulfur, radioactive sulfur in that bacteria as a result of it. Likewise, if it was DNA, we would expect that phosphorus to be in higher concentrations. So ultimately we saw that the conclusion was that DNA was gonna be inside that bacteria. And so that means that that high, high concentration of radioactive phosphorus was in that bacteria. And it led to the idea that DNA is in fact the transforming principle. So now we're looking in terms of the shape of the DNA molecule with regards to Wilkins and Franklin's uh, scientific discovery. And the cool thing about this is that they use something new, they use a new technology, and they use something called X-ray crystallography, where a beam of X-rays was shone at a crystallized sample of DNA, and the pattern was then created as a result of this X-ray hitting this crystal, and all things that either absorb or reflect radiation uh, it allowed for that shape to kind of be formed as a result. And this pattern was create, that was created told Franklin a few things about DNA. And she was like, okay, well, what does it tell us? Well, and when we talk about crystallized, we're just talking about a dry sample, essentially suspended in a dried medium. So it tells us that that sugar phosphate backbone faces outward while the bases face inward. And this is an important distinction because the the DNA itself, the genetic material that is transferred onward to offspring and used to code for proteins and stuff, it's going to be found in those bases which need to be protected so they face inward. DNA is double-stranded and it forms a shape that is double helix. And it also has a diameter of 2 nanometers as well as a distance of 3.4 nanometers for one turn of the helix. Nanometer is one millionth of a meter. So it was interesting because this information uh, allowed for us to kind of start to visualize the shape of DNA, how it organizes itself, why it fits in certain spaces as a result of its structure, and how it can be, uh, uh, how it can store information and save that information without being degraded or eroded. So lastly, we're going to look at Watson and Crick, and they are the famed scientists that kind of looked at the model of DNA and they use the information available to them to create that model uh, that we still use today. So their model included a double helix and sugar phosphate backbone facing outward. Thank you very much, Ms. Franklin. They looked at complementary nitrogenous bases facing inward and held together by hydrogen bonds. The strands, this must be in an anti-parallel direction for the molecule to be stable. And the reason being is that the, it's really cool the way that the stability works, that three prime N must be on the first strand, must have an OH group on that sugar okay it needs to have that oh group on that sugar uh and the five prime end strand must have that phosphate group attached to it this allows for the attachment of molecules onto there as needed and, and again we'll talk about that in lesson three tomorrow when we look at how dna is synthesized and and created and copied etc uh, lastly the strands on the three prime end and opposite are opposite to the five prime end in the first strand so it's so again it's going to have a lot to do with the replication of dna and how dna is read we'll talk more about that tomorrow so dna needs to be the right shape and size for it to be correctly utilized and used by enzymes and when we start to look at which enzymes kind of unravel dna read dna and translate dna you'll start to really appreciate that that double helix 
and, and its anti-parallel nature allow for a lot of that to happen. Okay, folks, that's it for lesson two. We are done for the lessons during today. I'm gonna post both lessons to YouTube. So hopefully if you missed anything for lesson one or two, you can review those lessons. And the rest of the day, we're gonna to use to answer questions about lessons one and two, look at the assignment that I'm gonna to post to classroom now, as well as working on that part one of our culminating assignment.